What's up everybody, Steven here for Off The Shelf Movie Night to talk to you about physical media, about Blu-rays and 4Ks and even DVDs, the way we like to buy and own our movies and TV shows and documentaries and that kind of thing, and have a collection and watch them when and how we want. This is also a good spot if you're just a fan of movies. If you want to be a collector, you already are a collector, join us. If you just like talking movies, you should also join us here. Hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, be part of the crowd here. Because right now, I'm about to talk to you about movies. Specifically, not physical media, but movies that I saw in the theater. Many of you know that I do a Pushing 100 project, where I'm trying to see 100 films in theater in one year this year. I just hit 50 films, and I'm going to give you a little update. I'm going to do a little bit more of a review on one and just mention the other. The one I'm going to mention, first and foremost, is the new Minions movie. I saw it, and in a nutshell, I'm just going to say, meh. I didn't think the story was good. I didn't think it was very funny. It's just, I don't know. I like the minions. I think they're cute. I think they're funny, whatever. But I just, this movie is a nothing burger to me. Um, Maybe it's more for little kids. The little kids like it. I don't remember hearing a lot of busting out laughing in the theater I was in during the screening. It was pretty sedate and there was a good number of people in there, honestly. So I, I don't I just don't I don't think it's that good. Okay. That's that's literally all there is to say about it. It's an animated movie for little kids. So I also saw the black phone. And I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna give you my thoughts on it. There may be minor spoilers. It's been out for a number of weeks now. There might be minor spoilers. I'm not gonna give any major spoilers. Mainly I just have to talk about some character specific things to be able to tell you what my negatives for the movie are. Uh uh, the TLDR of it is this. I like the movie thought it was quite good. And that's a big deal. It's a big statement coming from me because I don't like the mass major- majority. Majority. What, what the heck kind of word is that? The mass majority of Blumhouse films. When I see the Blumhouse logo, uh, I automatically cringe because honestly, most of their movies are bad. I, I, I'm so confused when I see people here on YouTube and over on TikTok talking about how great this Blumhouse movie is or how great that Blumhouse movie is. And I go and look at it and it's hot garbage. I feel sad for people because they don't know what a good horror movie really is. Because so many of of the things that Blumhouse puts out are just, you know, low-fi, low-quality, like sci-fi channel midnight movies. They're just not good. I'm sorry, they are not good a lot of them feature some bad cgi they all have the same green color palette in the color grading of them they're just not good so when i do see a good blumhouse movie i get excited and this is a good one this one does feature some of that crappy color grading that's i think it's just meant to hide low budget sometimes maybe but yeah, it's the color grading here. There is some really beautiful shots, especially toward the beginning. There's some really gorgeous, like natural looking sepia, like magic hour type of footage that's beautiful. But it eventually changes to this typical Blumhouse green that I think is just atrocious. That said, that said, coming out of the movie, I was very pleasantly surprised and highly entertained. I had a great time with the movie. So, it's the story of a small town where they have a serial killer. I'm I guess they don't 100% know that he's a killer because he really just abducts kids. They don't know because they haven't found him if he's killing them, but the assumption is that he is. And they call him the Grabber, which I think there could have been a, a better name, a more creative name. This is Joe Hill for going to say Joe Hill is Stephen King's son, and we'll get more into that in a minute. So, so yeah, the entire town is afraid of him. It's become uh, something that kids talk about all the time. But it's weird because they have this grabber who's obviously kidnapping people, but kids are still walking home alone. Um, that's one of the first minor little things that kind of sticks in my craw a little bit because it's like, would you let your kid walk home alone still if there was a serial kidnapper out there, probably serial killer out there focused on kids, would you let them still do that? I don't think so. So you have to take some logic leaps to to get into the movie, obviously. You have to be 
kind of ready and okay with that. Yeah. So the kids obviously are super precocious. One of them precocious beyond her years, leading to some pretty funny moments in the movie. But yeah, she that that I don't actually think of as a negative though. That's just part of the sort of genre of film that this is. It was like that, for example. So here are the great things. I have not read this story, but I can feel the Joe Hill slash Stephen King character creation engine in the story. And that is a very positive thing. Because the one thing Stephen King has always done well is develop characters, meaty characters you could sink your teeth into and really get to know. And then as I became more aware of Joe Hill with things like Lock and Key, I could see that that apple had not fallen far from the tree because Joe Hill does the same thing. He can really build characters. And you can feel, even though Joe Hill really only wrote the story that this is based on, you can feel some of his story, those aspects of his story survived into the movie and the the, the screenplay that they wrote and eventually the movie. Now, the problem with that is, let's just get to that in a minute. I want to stay on the good stuff. So Ethan Hawke is the grabber and he's the reason to see this movie. He is not in it as much as you might expect, but the scenes he is in are are very well executed by both him and the director, Scott Derrickson. I, I, the only other Scott Derrickson thing I've seen is Doctor Strange, I think. He may have done something else that, that I'm not thinking of. I've not seen Sinister. I know everyone says I should. I, I guess I will at some point, but just looking at it, it looks like that Blumhouse garbage that I don't like. But I guess after this, I need to give it a chance, honestly. I do. So, yeah. So, it, it's like, you know, that really rich, sweet dessert that you only need a few bites of. That's kind of Ethan Hawke's performance. It's in the film enough. The film does a good job of building tension and a creepy creepy atmosphere. All this stuff works pretty well. And the Joe Hill aspects of the small town that are still in place work pretty well. Overall, that's all good stuff. There's a few jump scares that actually work. I mean, they're cheap, but jump scares are always cheap, you know? A cheap jump scare is fine as long as it's built into a really great atmosphere. And and it is. It is in this movie. So, overall, great time. Those are my positives. Kid performances are solid. There's some circular storytelling in here that I really, really loved. I love when you can get circular storytelling right, and I'm not going to spoil it, I'm not going to say it, you just need to see the movie, and then you'll see, you know. Circular storytelling is kind of like bookends. You start at a place, you start with a character, a line, a location, a something, and then you can circle back to it at the end and complete that circle. And this movie does that in a brilliant way, and I love it so much for that. So, good, there we go. All right, so to the negatives. The detectives that are investigating the case, let me move this mic a little closer, it feels like rushed. And I don't know now in retrospect if it's necessarily rushed or there's just not a lot of meat on the bone for the actual story because it turns out that this movie and script are based on a short story, which is fine. You know, this, you know, Stand By Me was a short story also, but you have to be, as a, uh, a screenplay author, you have to be able to build out that story better. These detectives seem to be hitting bullet points. It just is a pop, 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 pop. You know, it's really quick and just an afterthought. There is an additional supernatural element in this film that is represented in the trailers if you haven't seen it. And it's the story of the little girl and her ability to have some psychic ability. You don't need it. It was unneeded. They should have focused on some other things and made them better. They should not have even had that. It was not necessary. They could have focused more on building out the detective story, the procedural elements to make them feel more like a story rather than bullet points. And the other thing, too, that that King does and also Joe Hill does, too, is they add a quirky, interesting extra character that's like a stick of dynamite that can sort of set things off in a way you weren't expecting. That character is in this movie. But he gets nothing to do. 
He's in there for a scene, and the, then he is gone. It's almost like I'm watching it, and I'm like, why did you even bother introducing that character if you were going to have... Okay, so he's not he's not gone, I guess. I say I'm trying not to spoil. He's not gone, but I, I just, I, he's not properly utilized, okay? It just feels like, you know... I can't say it. I can't. I can't spoil it. This would be really heavy spoiler territory. But they introduce this character. He's interesting, and then he's kind of gone until the story is wrapped up. And I, I don't know. I just feel it could have been better somehow. I feel that character could have been handled a little better somehow. And that's all I'm going to say about that. I'll leave it to you. Now I want to wrap up on the negative side with what I think is the most complicated. Let me tell you his name. Honestly, the most complicated character in the movie is played by, where is his name? Jeremy Davies. That's why I couldn't, it, it, I couldn't draw a blank on his name. He plays the father of the two kids. Now, he has a very sad backstory. The things that have led he and his family to where they exist now is very sad and has had a very negative impact on him. But he is made pretty villainous early on in the film. But he doesn't get any redemption, really. And we're supposed to have sympathy for him by the end of the film. And it, to me, it, it plays false. It, does, it rings false because he didn't have enough development somehow. It's, it's a very hard character to make him as villainous as they did and then try to give him a sympathetic, you know, ending to his story. And it just, it's its a failure in directing, honestly. And maybe a failure in writing, too. There may have not been anything else to play with story-wise. But that character did not work as well for me as he should have, right? So that that's really my only complaints. Otherwise, a, a good time, you know? I, I don't know if this, I've seen some other people on on YouTube and especially over on TikTok that are calling this a masterpiece, it's not a masterpiece, you guys. If you don't, The Exorcist is a masterpiece. Even if you don't like it because of its dated presentation, it's still a masterpiece. It's one that'll be talked about. It's been talked about since it was made in the 70s. It'll be talked about 50 years from now. The black phone will be gone this time next year. No one's going to continue talking about it. This is not a freaking masterpiece. Stop being hyperbolic and start being real with your criticism, real with your reviews, so people have a really good, solid basis of what to expect. The Black Phone is features some really solid performances by the two kids and by Ethan Hawke, and it offers a great, you know, spooky movie night at the theater or, you know, later on at home, but it's not something I'll be re-watching over and over and over again. Uh, on Letterbox, I would give this baby a 3 to 3.5 out of 5, and that would be great. I mean, it's not an insult. It is what it is. It's a good one-time watch. I think Joe Hill can and will do better writing-wise, I, and I think someone is going to grab one of his stories and just blow us away. That said, one of the better Blumhouse movies, highly recommended. Added this to my Pushing 100, very happy to have done so. No regrets. I don't have a, a reg honestly don't have a regret for any movie I watch. I give everything a try, but this is one I'll be happy to step away from and say, yeah, it was a good time. The Minions movie that I watched before that, mm, not so much, not so much, not not a good movie. Anyway, this pushed me to fifty. If you want to follow my pushing one hundred project as I go, I put stuff in two places on. TikTok, I post uh, immediate reactions as I'm seeing the movies, like after I've seen it. I'll come out of the theater and do a reaction. And then I also post over on Letterboxd. That's uh, Culture Smash. I put that down here earlier. But I'll put it again in a minute. And those are the two places you can stay, you know, up to the minute. Otherwise, I'll post updates here on the YouTube channel a little bit here and a little bit there as we go, pushing our way to 100. If you've seen any of these movies and you have a, um, a thought or a comment or you want to have a conversation, I'm happy to do so. I love talking movies. Hit me up in the comments. Until next we meet, pull something cool off the shelf, share it with your friends and family, and remind them why physical media is the best way to watch films and TV. I'll see you guys on the next one.